Hop Frog by Edgar Allan Poe. I never knew anyone so keenly alive to a joke as the king was. He seemed to live only for joking, to tell a good story of the joke kind, and to tell it well was the surest road to his favor. Thus it happened that his seven ministers were all noted for their accomplishments as jokers. They all took after the king, two in being large, corpulent, oily men, as well as inimitable jokers. Whether people grow fat by joking, or whether there was something in fat itself which prepodizes to a joke, I have never been quite able to determine. But it is certain that a lean joker is a rara avis in terris. About the refinements, or, as he called them, the ghost of wit, the king troubled himself very little. He had an especial admiration for breath in a jest, and would often put up with length for the sake of it. Over niceties wearied him. He would have preferred Raphael's Gargantua to the Zadig of Voltaire. And, upon the whole, practical jokes suited his taste far better than verbal ones. At the date of my narrative, professing gestures had not altogether gone out of fashion at court. Several of the great continental powers still retained their fools who wore motley, with caps and bells, and who were expected to be always ready with sharp witticisms at a moment's notice, in consideration of the crumbs that fell from the royal table. Our king, as a matter of course, retained his fool. The fact is, he required something in the way of folly, if only to counterbalance the heavy wisdom of the seven wise men who were his ministers, not to mention himself. His fool, or professional gesture, was not only a fool, however. His value was trebled in the eyes of the king, by the fact of his also being a dwarf and a cripple. Dwarfs were as common at court in those days as fools, and many monarchs would have found it difficult to get through their days, days are rather longer than court than elsewhere, without both a gesture to laugh with and a dwarf to laugh at. But, as I have already observed, your gestures, in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred, are fat, round, and unwieldy, so that it was no small source of self-gratulation with our king in that, in Hupfrog, this was the fool's name, he possessed a triplicate treasure in one person. I believe the name Hopfrog was not that given, given to the dwarf by his sponsors at baptism, but was conferred upon him by general consent of the seven ministers, on account of his inability to walk as other men do. In fact, Hopfrog could only get along by sort of an interjectional gait, something between a leap and a wriggle, a moment, a movement that afforded ill, Ill, illimitable amusement, and a coarse consolation to the king, for, notwithstanding the protuberance of his stomach and a constitutional swelling of the head, the king, by his whole court, was accounted a capital figure. But although Hopfrog, though the distortion of his legs could only move with great pain and difficulty along a road or floor, the prodigious muscular power which nature seemed to have bestowed upon his arms, by way of compensation for deficiency in the lower limbs, enabled him to perform many feats of wonderful dexterity, where trees or ropes were in question, or anything else to climb. At such exercises he certainly much more resembled a squirrel, or a small monkey, than a frog. I am not able to say with precision from what country Hop Frog originally came. It was some barbarous region, however, that no person ever heard of a, a vast distance from the court of our king. Hop Frog and a very young girl, very little less dwarfish than himself, although of exquisite proportions and a marvelous dancer, had been forcibly carried off from their respective homes in adjoining provinces and sent as presents to the king by one of his ever victorious generals. Under these circumstances, it is not to be wondered that at a close intimacy arose between the two little captives. Indeed, they soon became sworn friends. Hopfrog, who, although he made a great deal of sport, was by no means popular, had it not been in, in his power to render Trippetta many services. But she, on account of her grace and exquisite beauty, although a dwarf, was universally admired and petted. So she possessed much influence and never failed to use it, whenever she could, for the benefit of Hopfrog. On some grand state occasion, I forget what, uh, the king determined to have a masquerade, and whenever a masquerade or any kind of that thing occurred at our court, 
then the talents of both Hopfrog and Trefetta were sure to be called into play. Hopfrog, in especial, was so intensive in the way of getting up pageants, suggesting novel characters and a raging costume for his masked balls, that nothing could be done, it seems, without his assistance. The night appointed for the fete had arrived. A gorgeous hall had been fitted up under Trepetta's eye, and with every kind of advice which could possibly give eclate to a masquerade. The whole court was in favor of expectation. As for costumes and characters, it might as well be supposed that every had everybody had come to a decision on such points. Many had made up their minds as to what roles they would assume a week or even a month in advance, and in fact there was not a particle of indecision anywhere, except in the case of the king and his seven ministers. Why they hesitated I could never tell, unless they did it by the way of a joke. More probably I f they found it difficult on account of being so fat to make up their minds. At all events, time flew, and as a last resort, they sent Trepetta and Hopfrog. When the two little friends obeyed the summons of the king, they found him sitting at his wine and the seven members of his cabinet council, but the monarch appeared to be in very ill humor. He knew that Hopfrog was not fond of wine, for it excited the poor cripple almost to madness, and madness is no comfortable feeling, but the king loved his practical jokes and took pleasure in forcing Hopfrog to drink and, as the, dr as the king called it, to be merry. Come here, Hopfrog, he said, as the jester and his friend entered the room. Swallow this bumper to the health of your absent friends. Here, Hopfrog sighed, and then let us have the benefit of your invention. We want characters, characters, man, something novel, out of the way, and we are wearied with everlasting sameness. Come, drink, the wine will brighten your wits. Hopfrog endeavored, as usual, to get a jest, up a jest in reply to these advances from the king but the effort was too much. It happened to be a poor dwarf's birthday, and the command to drink his absent friends forced the tears of his eyes. Many large, bitter teardrops fell into the goblet as he took it humbly from the hand of the tyrant. Ah ha ha ha! roared the latter, as the dwarf reluctantly drained the beaker. See what a glass of good wine can do! Why, your eyes are shining already! Poor fellow! His eyes gleamed rather than shone, for the effect of wine on his excitable brain was not more powerful than instantaneous. He placed the goblet norm nervously on the table and looked up upon the round company with a half-insane stare. They see all seemed highly amused at the success of the king's joke. Announce the business, said the prime minister, a very fat man. Yes, said the king. Come, Hopfrog, lend us your assistance. Characters, my fine fellow, we stand in no need of characters, all of us, ha ha, ha ha, and as was this seriously meant for a joke, his laugh was chorused by the seven. Hopfrog also laughed, although feebly and somewhat vacantly. Come, come, said the king impatiently, have you nothing to suggest? I am endeavoring so to think of something novel, replied the dwarf, abstractedly, for he was quite bewildered by the wine. Endeavoring, quieted the tri triumph fiercely. What do you mean by that? Ah, I perceive. You are sulky and want more wine. Here, drink this. And he poured out another goblet and offered it to the cripple, who merely grazed at it, gasping for breath. Drink, I say, said out the monster. Or by the fiends. The dwarf hesitated. The king grew purple with rage. The courtier smirked. Trepetta, pale as a corpse, advanced to the monarch's seat and falling on her knees before him, implored him to spare her friend. The tyrant regarded her for some moments in evident wonder at her obsessity. He seemed quite at a loss what to do or say, how most becomingly to violently from him, and threw the contents of the brimming goblet in her face. The poor girl got up as best as she could, and not daring even to sigh, resumed her position at the foot of the table. There was a dead silence for about half a minute during which the falling of leaf or feather might have been heard. It was interrupted by a low but harsh and protracted great in sound, which seemed to come at once from every corner of the room. What, what, what are you making that noise for? demanded the king, turning furiously to the dwarf. The latter seemed to have recovered in great measure from his intoxication, and looking fixedly but quietly into the tyrant's face, merely ejaculated, I, I... How could it have been me? 
The sound appeared to come from without, observed one of his courtiers. I fancy it was the parrot at the window, wetting his bill upon his cage wires. True, replied the monarch, as if much relieved by the suggestion. But, on the honor of a knight, I could have sworn that it was the gritting of this vagabond's teeth. Hereupon the dwarf laughed. The king was too confirmed, a joker to object to anyone's laughing, and displayed a set of large, powerful, very repulsive teeth. Moreover, he avowed his perfect willingness to swallow as much wine as desired. The monarch was pacified, and having drained another bumper with no very perceptible ill effort, Hopfrog entered at once, and with spirit, into the plans for the masquerade. I cannot tell what the association of idea, observed he very tranquilly, and as if he had never tasted wine in his life, but after, just, just after your majesty had struck the girl and thrown wine in her face, just after your majesty had done this, and while the parrot was making that odd noise outside the window, there came into my mind a capital diversion, one of my own country frolics, often enacted by among us at our masquerades, but here it will be new together, altogether. Unfortunately, however, it requires the company of eight persons, and here we are, cried the king, laughing at his acute discovery of the coincidence. Eight to a fraction, I and my seven ministers. Come, what is the diversion? We call it, replied the cripple, the eight-chained orang-utangs, and it is really excellent sport if well enacted. We will enact it, remarked the king, drawing himself up and lowering his eyelids. The beauty of the game, continued Hopfrog, lies in the fright of occasions among the women. Capital, roared in chorus the monarch in his ministry. I will equip you with orang otangs, proceeded the dwarf. Leave all that to me. The resemblance shall be so striking that the company of masqueraders will take you for real beasts, and of course they will be much terrified as astonished. Oh, this is exquisite, exclaimed the king. Hopfrog, I will make a man out of you. The chains are for the purpose of increasing the confusion by their jaggling. You are supposed to have escaped en masse from your keepers. Your majesty cannot conceive the effect produced at a masquerade by eight changed orangutans, imagined to be real ones by most of the company, and rushing in with savage cries among the crowd of delicacy and gorgeously habited men and women. The contrast is in, 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 inimitable. It must be, he said the king, and the council arose hurriedly, as it was growing late, to put in execution the scheme of Hopfrog. His mode of equipping the party as orangutans was very simple, but effective enough for his purposes. The animals in question had, at the epoch of my story, very rarely been seen in any part of the civilized world, and as imitations made by the dwarf were sufficiently beast-like, and more than sufficiently hideous, their truthfulness to nature was thus thought to be secured. The king and his ministers were first encased in tight-fitting stocking the shirt, stockinet shirts and drawers. They were then saturated with tar. At this stage of the process, some one of the party suggested feathers, but this suggestion was at once overruled by the dwarf, who convinced the eight by ocular demonstration that the hair of such a fruit as the orangutan was much more efficiently represented by flax. A thick coating of the latter was accordingly plastered upon the coating of tar. A long chain was now procured. First, it was passed about the waist of the king, and tied around then about another of the party, and also tied then about all successively in the same manner. When this chaining arrangement was complete, and the party stood as a fart as, as a, each other for as possible, they formed a circle, and to make things appear natural, Hopfrog passed the residue of the chain in two diameters at right angles across the circle after the fashion adopted at the present day by those who captured chimpanzees or very large apes in Borino. The grand saloon in which the masquerade was to take place was a circular room, very lofty, and receiving the light of the sun only through a singular window at the top. At night, the season for which the apartment was especially designed, was, it was illuminately, illuminated principally by a large chandelier, depending by a chain from the center of the skylight, and lowered or elevated by the means of a counterbalance as usual, but, in order to not look unsightly, this latter passed outside the cupola and over the roof. The arrangements of the room had been left to Trippetta's superintendence, but, in some particulars, it seems, 
she had been guided by that calmer judgment of her friend the dwarf, as it was his suggestion it was that, on this occasion, that the chandelier was removed, its waxen drippings, which, in weather so warm, it was quite impossible to prevent, would have been seriously detrimental to the rich dresses of the guests, who, on account of the crowded state of the saloon, would not all be expected to keep out of its center, that is to say, from under the chandelier. Additional scones were set in various parts of the hall, out of way, and a flambeau emitting sweet odor was placed in the right hand of each of the caryatides that stood against the wall, some fifty or sixty altogether. The eight orangutans, taking Hopfrog's advice, waited patiently before midnight, until midnight, when the room was thoroughly filled with masqueraders, before making their appearance. No sooner had the clock ceased striking, however, than they rushed, or rather rolled in altogether, for the impediments of their chains caused mostly most of the party to fall and to stumble as they entered. The excitement among the master raiders was prodigious and filled the heart of the king with glee. As had been much anticipated, there were not a few of the guests who supposed the ferocious-looking creatures to be beasts or some kind in, uh, in reality, if not precisely orangutans. Many of the women swooned in a fright, and had not the king taken the precaution to exclude all weapons from the saloon, this party might soon have been exculpated for their frolic in their blood, as it was a general rush made for the doors, but the king had ordered them to be locked immediately upon his entrance, and, at the dwarf's suggestion, the keys had been deposited with him. While the tumult was at its height, and each masquerader attentive only to his own safety, for, in fact, there was not much there was much real danger from the presence of the excited crowd. The chain by which the chandelier ordinarily hung, which had been drawn up on its removal, might have been very gradually seen very gradually to descend until its hooked extremity came within three feet of the floor. Soon after this, the king and his seven friends, having reeled about the hall in all directions, found themselves at length in its center and, of course, in immediate contact with the chain. While they were thus situated, the dwarf who had followed noiselessly at their heels, inciting them to keep up with the commotion, took hold of their own chain at the intersection of the two portions which crossed the circle di diametrically at his right angles. Here, with rapidity, rapidity of thought, he inserted the hook from which the chandelier had been wont to depend, and in an instant, by some unseen agency, the chandelier chain was drawn so far upward as to take the hook out of reach, and as an inevitable consequence to drag the orangutans together in close connection and face to face. The masqueraders by this time had recovered in some measure from their alarm, and beginning to regard the whole matter as a well-contrived pleasantry, set up a loud shout of laughter at the predicament of the apes. Leave them to me, now screamed Hopfrog, his shrill voice making himself easily heard throughout all the din. Leave them to me. I fancy I know them. If I can only get a good look at them, I can soon tell who they are. Here, scrambling over the heads of the crowd, he managed to get to the wall, when, seizing a flambeau from one of the caryatides, he returned, as he went, to the center of the room, leaped uh, with the agility of a monkey upon the king's head, and thence clambered a few feet up from the chain. Holding down the torch to examine the group of orangutans, and still screaming, I shall soon find out who they are. And now, while the whole assembly, the apes included, were convulsed with laughter, the jester suddenly uttered a shrill whistle, when the chain flew violently for up about thirty feet, dragging with it the dismayed and struggling orangutans, leaving them suspended in midair between the skylight and the floor. Hopfrog, leaning to the chain as it rose, still maintained his relative position in respect to the eight masters, and still, as it were nothing the matter, continued to thrust his torch down toward them, as though endeavoring to discover who they were. So thoroughly astonished was the whole company at his ascent, that a dead silence of about a minute's duration ensued. It was broken by just a such low, harsh, grating sound, as had before attracted the attention of the king and his counsellors, which the former threw the wine in the face of Trapetta. But, on the present occasion, there could be no question as to whence the sound issued. It came from fang like teeth of the dwarf, who round them and gnashed them as he foamed at the mouth, and glared with an expression of maniacal rage 
and to the upturned countenances of the king and his seven companions. Aha, he said at length of the infuriated gesture. Aha, I have begun to see who these people are now. Here, pretending to scrutinize the king more closely, he held at the flambeau to the flaxen coat which enveloped him, and which instantly burst into a sheet of vivid flame. In less than half a minute, the whole eight orangutans were blazing fiercely, amid the shrieks of the multitude who gazed at them from below, horror-stricken and without the power to render them the slightest assistance. At length the flames, suddenly increasing in virulence, forced the jester to climb higher up the chain, to be out of their reach, and, as he made this movement, crowd sank again for a brief instant into silence. The dwarf seized his opportunity and once more spoke. I now see this distinctly, he said. What manner of people these maskers are. They are a great king and a seven privy counselors, a king who does not scoop, scruple to strike a defenseless girl and his seven counselors who abet him in the outrage. As for myself, I am simply Hot Frog, the jester, and this is my last jest. Owing to the high combustibility of both the flax and the tar to which it adhered, the dwarf had scarcely made an end of his brief speech before the work of vengeance was completed. The eight corpses swung in their chains, a fetid, blackened, hideous, and indistinguishable mass. The cripple hurled his torch at them, clambered leisurely to the ceiling, and disappeared through the skylight. It is supposed that Trepetta, stationed on the roof of the saloon, had been the accomplice of her friend in the fiery revenge, and that together they effected the escape to their own country, for neither was seen again.